Um, I'm going to be speaking about um, a decidability result for a subclass of um, alternating automaton trees and infinite trees. But I will spend most of my time introducing the model and talking about the restriction and um, intuitions and context. I will just mention the, I will formulate the result at, at the, um, uh, in one of the last slides. So this is joint work with uh, Jacques Dupac from University of Lausanne and Alessandro Facchini, who uh, was in Warsaw when we worked on this, and now is in Amsterdam. So let me just start from, um, probably for most of you it's, uh, it's known, but I will recall it anyway. So um, my uh, model of automata is alternating automata on infinite trees. I'm using the parity condition. Um, the, I will just point out that the form of transition function I'm using is, um, is as follows. It takes a state and a, uh, and a letter, and it gives a positive Boolean combinations of pairs, uh, direction and state. Okay, so it's something like this: you either go uh, right in the state Q1, or you go right in the state Q2, and uh, sorry, and you, and you either go in the right in the state Q2 or left in the state Q3. Uh, this uh, function rank is used to define accepting uh, runs or accepting plays. Um, I will uh, talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, it's essential, uh, the essential parameter of uh, this model of automata is the number of uh, ranks that you're using. It's not just the number, but also whether you start uh, from an odd or even rank, okay? So this measure that's used for expressing how complex your acceptance condition is, is called index and it consists of the minimal rank use and the maximal rank use. Now, let me recall uh, the, uh, how, how such an automaton works. So basically, a computation of such an automaton is a game uh, that's played by two players, uh, box and diamond. Uh, so the play starts in the root of the tree uh, with, uh, in the initial state. Uh, and then if the root has label A, then we replace the initial state with uh, the Boolean combination given by the transition function. And now the players make their choices depending on the, on the outermost operator. So if uh, the Boolean combination is at this junction, then Diamond chooses whether he wants phi 1 or phi 2. And this phi i replaces phi. And if it's a conjunction, it's a box who chooses. Now, finally, you go down to a single pair, uh, direction and state. And this pair tells you, OK, so it's 0 q, so you go left. Uh, to, so to the left child in the state Q. If it's one Q, you move right in the state Q. And uh, uh, diamond wins such a, such a play if, the sequence, if in the sequence of ranks, uh, so th this is defined by the sequence of states that are visited, okay? So if in this sequence, the, the maximal rank that was seen infinitely often is even, then diamond wins, okay? If it's otherwise, then box wins. And we say that the tree is accepted by this automaton if diamond has a winning strategy for it. Now, I would like you to uh, think of the following very, very simple operation. So imagine you have two automata, and you fix the state QS. And you look at uh, its occurrence in some transition, OK? Now, I'll do the following thing. I will substitute the state QS with the initial state of the second automaton. OK, so the, a very, very simple uh, operation. So you could see that on the picture as follows. You have these two automata. You fix one uh, state and occurrence of this state in a, transitional, in, a, in a transition. And then you just move this single, you, you modify this single arrow. Instead of pointing to this green state, it now points to the initial state of the other automaton. Now, it's a kind of obvious observation. But if I take a different automaton B prime, that is equivalent to B, what I get is, again, an equivalent automaton, right? So changing a subcomponent of the automaton to an equivalent one doesn't change the semantics of the whole automaton, right? Yeah, so basically, if the language is recognized by B and C are the same, then after substituting B and C, I again get the same language. 
But what if I look at coarser equivalence relations? So let's first look at the one at the bottom. So I will say that two languages are equivalent if the minimal index of automata A prime, such that A prime uh, recognizes L of A, is the same as the minimal index of automata B prime recognizing B, then they are equivalent. Okay? So you look at the smallest index of the automaton recognizing the language. This puts the, the language in an equivalence class. And you look at this equivalence relation. Now, uh, the, the other relation is, uh, is much more, uh, more fine-grained. Uh, you demand that there exist a, a con two continuous functions, f and g, such that the inverse image of L of A is L of B, and the inverse image of L of B is L of A. What do I mean by continuous function? So you can, uh, you can equip the space of infinite trees with natural metric uh, counter-like. So if you know this, then, then it's good. If you don't know this, then just uh, think of the following characterization. I will say that a function is continuous if I can determine, say, nth level of the output after knowing some fixed number of levels of the input, OK? So you ask me, what is the seventh level of your tree? And I say, if you give me 17 first levels of the input, I will give you the output, OK? So that's a continuous function. It by, by no means it has to be computable, OK? It's just an, uh, an abstract construct. Now, so why are these important? Uh, they constitute uh, two. Uh, measures of complexity of um, omega regular language. You can sort, in a way, uh, languages using those relations. So basically, a language is said to be more complex in the topological sense if it can be reduced to the other. So if there exists a function from A uh, such that the inverse image of uh, B is A, then I say that A is simpler than B. And uh, for, for the, um, the index equivalence relation, Basically, the higher the index, the more you can recognize. Yeah, so these are two uh, quite uh, widely studied complexity measures for, for languages of infinite objects, not just uh, trees, also words. I, I listed several papers. This is uh, obviously not, not all that was done in this area, but I just listed the ones that I was uh, influenced by uh, most. So let's focus for a second on this uh, index uh, hierarchy. So if one tries to understand complexity of uh, omega languages, say, of trees, what one often wants to do is to describe the two hierarchies. So kind of understand which languages are more complex than, than others in terms of those hierarchies, and also try to describe the whole hierarchy. So in a way, one can think that if one understands the structure of this hierarchy, one has a kind of classification of languages. So it's not precise. We abstract from some uh, aspects, but we, we, we kind of understand the structure in a way. So the typical questions one asks is, well, the description of the hierarchy, and if possible, an effective description. So I want to have an effective characterization of every level of, of a hierarchy like this. Uh, the index hierarchy it comes in different flavors because it depends on which kind of automata you're using. So, you can ask about deterministic index. That will mean the smallest index of a deterministic automaton recognizing a language, or non-deterministic, or alternating, weak alternating, etc. Sometimes this, the answer would be infinity or impossible. Yes, if you give, uh, if you take a, a language that is not weakly recognizable, and you ask about weak alternating index, then the answer might be no chance. Yeah. So this, uh, yes. Yeah, so as I said, the the, the uh, the classes uh, form um, a hierarchy. The shape is like this. So basically, uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you take, a, say, class of languages recognized by 0, 2 automata, so the ones that only use ranks 0, 1, 2, and you take the complement, then you, you, you take the, the, compl the complements of the languages, then you, you, you get the class of uh, languages recognized by, by 1, 3 automata. Uh, the question to, to ask is whether this, so there are two questions. The first one is whether this hierarchy is strict. And uh, if so, then, uh, then what is the minimal index needed to recognize a given language? Yes, yeah, so that's the typical decidability question. And uh, for, in, in general, 
if you take alternating tree automata, uh, the strictness question was answered positively some time ago. Uh, I guess the first proof uh, would be Julian Bradfield. Um, and th there are concrete examples of languages that cannot be recognized by, uh, by automata with, uh, with small index. So this is uh, an example for, uh, so this is, it, the language is called W13. And it's an example of a language that is recognized by 1.3 automaton, but not by a 0.2 automaton. So not by the dual one, yeah? Uh, so let me just quickly explain the language. So you look at the at trees that are labeled with uh, purs. So each letter is a pur. It contains of a box or a diamond and uh, a number, yeah? One, two, three. Now, on such a tree, you can play the same game that I explained uh, while defining the semantics of the automata, right? So the, player, the players start in the root, and in the root you see it's a diamond, right? So it's the diamond who makes the choice. He goes left or right. Then say he, he, he says, go right. I'm sorry, go from your point of view, go left, yeah? So, so he goes to, to this uh, node with a three. Again, it's, it's, uh, it's a diamond node, so he makes his choice again. He goes to two, let's say, uh, two on the right. So now it's box's choice, so box chooses the weight. And this way they produce again an infinite sequence of numbers. And again, we say that diamond wins uh, if uh, the highest rank seen infinitely often, the highest number seen infinitely often is, uh, is even. So it can be proved using a topological argument that, uh, quite a simple one based on, on, on uh, Banach principle, uh, that such a language cannot be recognized by, uh, by a zero to automaton. So if this is settled, then the second question would be to, defy, to, to uh, decide. The, um, the second question would be to decide the, uh, the index. This we don't know. We know it for a subclass uh, of, uh, so for a class of uh, deterministic uh, languages, so languages recognized by deterministic automata. What I mean by deterministic is that uh, basically each transition uh, is a conjunction of two pairs, zero something and one something. So in other words, the existential player, the, the diamond player, has no choice. And Box only chooses whether he wants to go left or right, but there is no choice um, about uh, the state. Yes, yeah, so, so, so this case was solved. Uh, but in some sense, uh, this case is very easy. Because the real, the, the real difficult part in, uh, in deciding properties of automata is non-determinism or alternation. So we're trying to come up with uh, uh, with a class that would uh, capture enough alternation to be non-trivial, but at the same time that would uh, um, have decidable properties. For instance, uh, the index uh, problem would be decidable or the, the wedge hierarchy problem. So, uh, yeah, so the, the general problem remains open. Now, you might ask, okay, so, so I want to solve this problem. Why did I start from substitutions? So wh wh why would substitutions help? So, so imagine that we have this property. Suppose that if I take two languages, B and C, uh, sorry, two automata, B and C, such that the languages recognized are wedge equivalent. Suppose it means that when I substitute, the obtained languages are also equivalent. How does that help? Now, it turns out that if you have this property, you can somehow compute the equivalence class by bottom-up evaluation. So you can treat strongly connected components of automata as operations on languages, on equivalence classes, not just languages. Yeah? So what I mean by this is that to each wedge equivalence class, you, you assign a certain canonical automaton that will be, it's, it's like a name of this class, okay? And now you start from the bottom. You look at the, at the graph or a tree of uh, strongly connected components of, of the automaton, and you, you, you start from the bottom. You look at the leaf components. Well, those you have to analyze by hand. There is no other chance, right? So you evaluate them. You find the canonical representations for them. And then you, you move up. You look at the, uh, at the component one level higher. You look at the canonical representation of its children. And if you understand the operation that stands behind this component, again, you can evaluate. I'm sorry, right? So you just move up, up, and finally you get the representation, the canonical representation of the whole automaton. 
Yeah? So that's what we would like to have. Unfortunately, if you take the class of uh, the whole class of alternating two automata, you don't have this property. Why? Well, the answer is very simple because set theoretical union of languages doesn't have this property. Uh, let's look at a very simple example. Um, it's going to be a word example, but you'll get the, 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 the taste of, uh, of what's going on. So look at the following three languages. The first one is just the language of infinite words such that one or two repeats infinity often. The second one is similar, only now we require that two repeats infinity often. Okay, and one doesn't repeat at all, but that doesn't really matter. And the third language is just the set of words such that from some point, some point on, you only see zeros. Yeah? Now, the first two languages, it's quite obvious that they're equivalent because the, the continuous reductions are actually letter to letter. So if you want to reduce the, the first language to the second language, you simply map zeros to zeros, ones and twos to twos. And this is, a, this is obviously a reduction in the sense I described previously. And vice versa, if you want to reduce the second language to the first language, you just take the identity mapping. And, and this is going to be OK. So the first two languages are identical. And also, if you look at them like directly, you see that they are, in fact, sort of the same language, yeah, just in disguise. Now, the thing is that if you add to them this third language of words that are finally uh, that finally stabilize at zero, then what you get in the first case is just the set of all possible words. This is as simple as it can be, yep, in the topological sense and also in the sense of the index or anything you want. Now, in the second case, you get the language of words over the alphabet one, uh, uh, sorry, zero, one, two, such that they satisfy the parity condition, so that the highest index repeating, highest number repeating infinitely often is two. So this language is, in many senses, like in the topological sense, it's much more difficult, but also in the sense of the index. If you take a deterministic uh, word automata, then this can be recognized by zero, two automaton, but not by, by uh, say, one, three automaton, okay? So there, there is huge difference between those two languages. So there is no chance we can, we can get this property for, for all automata, so we need, to find, uh, we need to find a class such that this property would work. Of course, one can imagine many different approaches, many different ways of solving the problem, but we kind of thought that this approach is, is elegant. So we tried to figure out what is the richest class such that we can use this approach and get the result. And uh, the answer is actually very simple. So since the problem is caused by union, you just have to get rid of union. Yep. You have to make sure that your, your, your automaton doesn't contain union anywhere. But the thing is that the union can be hidden somewhere. Yep. So the, the, the way you do it, the way you get rid of union like, entirely, is you say you, you exclude certain kind of transitions. So basically you say that a transition is dangerous. We call it ambiguous. If it contains two occurrences of the same direction. So that means that in some computation, the game can reach two places in the same uh, two, two places in the tree in two different states. That's what it means. So this is bad. This induces, uh, th this lets us encode somehow uh, union, or if uh, you get conjunction there, it's, it's, uh, it's intersection, which is equally dangerous. Uh, so we can prove the following theorem. If, uh, if you take a class of automata such that, well, it's over a fixed alphabet with at least two letters. If it's just one letter, there is not much to, uh, to do. Uh, you, uh, you assume that it's closed under substitution because this is the operation that you need to compute to, to evaluate your automaton. Uh, and it contains uh, trivial automata that reject everything and accept everything. Then uh, such a class is uh, preserve the equivalence, uh, the wedge equivalence under substitutions if uh, no automaton has an ambiguous transition. If you don't have ambiguous transitions, then it, you're, so the, here's, the, here's the proof, but I will skip it. If you don't have ambiguous transitions, then your transitions look like this. So basically, you're either, uh, this is like a deterministic transition in a way, and this is something I would call a co-deterministic transition. So it's existential player who makes the choice, diamond player, but again, he can only choose whether he goes left or right, but he cannot choose the state. Uh, so this is the class of automata that, we, that, that we're working on. It's not that weak, in fact. 
because for instance it can it captures all the, the languages that show strictness of the index hierarchy. Yeah, so it's it's quite powerful. It has enough de non determinism uh, to make it interesting, at least for us. Um, and uh, what we focused in this paper, so this is the main result. In fact, uh, I said I, I said it's going to be at the very last slide. So we focused on weak uh, game automata. So automata that don't have uh, ambiguous transitions, and also uh, they 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 are they have weak acceptance conditions. So that means that whenever you have a uh, whenever you can reach Q from Q prime and Q prime from Q, then the ranks of these two states are the same. So for such automata, we managed to, to show that, ah, yeah, so the picture is like this. Uh, so here are the deterministic automata for which we know how to decide things. And on the right, you get the, the weak game automata for which we didn't know anything, but now we do. Uh, so we managed to, to, to show that for every weak game automaton, you can find a wedge equivalent uh, automaton of a very special kind. So the special kind is, uh, is obtained by, um, by using several very, very simple constructions. So you can look at, at such a canonical automaton as if it uh, were a term that you construct with these operations. So th this automaton, it can be effectively constructed, the, the canonical one, and also, it has uh, the same weak index. Yeah? So I will show you the, uh, the operations. Don't try to analyze them. Uh, probably from the back rows, you cannot even see them. But the point of this slide is just to show that there is finitely many of them. Not that many, in fact. And they are quite simple. So the most complicated one, it requires three states. Now, the A, B, and the LM, they just stand for other components of the automata. Yeah? So that's where you put other automata. So it's like an operation on pairs of languages or pairs of automata. Uh, and uh, uh, for those operations, you can show, you can analyze how they operate on equivalence classes. And there is a mathematical way of describing uh, what they do to, to wedge equivalence classes. Again, don't try to read this even. Uh, there are formulae that, uh, that explain how, how the operations act on equivalence classes. Uh, and this way, since the operations are, uh, are effective, uh, we can uh, decide the wedge hierarchy and the Borel hierarchy. Mm, and what about the index uh, hierarchy? Well, since the automata uh, preserve, since the simplification, it preserves the index, and also uh, we could prove that weak index in the case of this WGA recognizable languages, so weak game languages, uh, the index is the same as the position in the Borel hierarchy. So basically, the two hierarchies, they coincide. So this also gives a decidability result for, uh, for the weak index problem. Okay. And that's it, basically it. Now, the biggest question that, that I could ask at the end what is uh, what happens if you remove this uh, weakness condition. So our conjecture is that the method should still work. It will require lots of computation, but we will try to do it uh, just for fun, I suppose. Um, the challenges are that, um, well, there is no Borel hierarchy beyond the weak languages. Uh, languages become non-Borel. So you move into the area of set theory where things behave strangely. You don't have the tendency axiom, and, and lots of different things can happen. Uh, instead of Borel classes, we can, look at, we can look at languages that are reducible to our uh, game languages. Yep, so uh, the, the languages I was describing uh, in the argument about the strictness of the hierarchy. And that this gives kind of a skeleton, and around this skeleton you could try to build the hierarchy. It's, it, it's going to be difficult, but, uh, but uh, it might give some further insight into the um, structure of, of automata. Yeah, so this is our um, aim for, for future. Thank you.